mindsets one mindset so give me a little bit more than that a lot of people are nervous about doing scripts and not sounding like a conversation but more sounding scripted and that's the point on why we do script practice every tuesday so you can get to a point where you sound like a conversation rather than a script and you get the information that you need but a lot of people have negative mindsets about it about right. doing that so i'm kind of jumping ahead when i pull up my slide so there's three things to that when you're dealing with script it's memorize personalize internalize so you can memorize the very cold script that sounds like something you would never say you personalize it to where you say it and here is the biggest secret behind scripts i'm going to tell you this secret it's the absolute secret to mastering scripts. You can't effectively use a script unless you really believe it. I know that might sound really like common sense, but a true effective script master is truly understanding vocabulary and being able to express and have a conversation and educate leads at a very high level. So it's not, well, if I was a doctor, would you want me to tell you the truth? Do you want me to tell you what you hear? I mean, and when somebody tries to pull that off, they'll lose. The reason I'm going into this is um, just to back up. When we created this class, I work with a lot of top producers, a lot of different companies. And I thought, how cool would it be? And it would be a double win. I'm a lead generator too, to call my clients and their buyers and sellers and ask in 2022, what was the most common objection? that you got. So one, I got to do a touch and have some conversations. Um, two, a couple things I learned. None of them were things I haven't heard before. I've been in this industry for 22 years. So they're the same objections and they're the same handlers. What I did realize or discover, and I do have a PowerPoint, we're gonna get into some meat, is that these top producers, I'm a script girl too, I've been teaching scripts forever. They, some of them don't have never even looked at scripts. They don't even use scripts at all, but they've been in the industry a long time and they're doing 20, 30 million. And when they talk about the objection and they overcome it, it's a script. I've heard the script. I can match it to a script, but it's their verbiage. It's their experience. And it's their own um, way of overcoming objections over years. Is, that, is anybody following me on that? Does that make sense? So teaching scripts for so many years and being in this industry for so long, what I my biggest aha and taking away from this little experiment and putting this all together was your masters and your top producers don't sound scripted. They're using scripts, but they don't sound scripted. Um, it was more conversational based. It was more learning and really understanding your market. And at the end of the day, it truly was. They believed what they were saying. They know what they're saying. A lot of them, it's not their first rodeo. So what I did is I put together, I started with the top 10, but really y'all, every single one of them had the same one. I, I mean, it, I was struggling to come up with 10 that were real and authentic. I could come up with 10. I have a whole book of scripts, right? That's really around eight. But um, it was more about the psychology uh, of the script and how to approach it and behavioral styles. So I took their scripts and put them in a little PowerPoint. Those, you know, and I've done that before. Usually it's a very um, black and white script and we say it over and over and over. I know this group already does that. So I wanted to share with you some real rich in content, actual conversation psychology behind overcoming these objections. So now I'm gonna try to share my screen. Don't laugh. Give me just a sec. Here we go. And oops. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Did I do it? You did it. Yay. Don't laugh at me. I'm authentic, y'all. I'm older than most of you. Yes, I've been doing Zooms. Yes, I've been doing share screens.
but you know, in the last probably six months, I've been more one-on-one. -on -one, so I'm still, I'm, I'm super old. All right. The three things with overcoming objections, and I've been teaching this for years, memorize, personalize, and internalize. So what exactly does that mean? So Amanda, I'm going to pick on you because I can see you. Tell me what that means to you to memorize, personalize, and internalize. For me, like I, I hear Mikey go through scripts and I think they're all amazing, but sometimes it's something that I would never say. And Jeff would say something completely different than me. So I think just kind of making it something of your own and making it relatable to your personality type and what what kind of clients you're working with um, will come across more authentically. Exactly. And internalize the third piece of that. What does internalize mean to you? Um, Make it almost like a part of your common communication we we joke almost you know don't do it until it's perfect practice it until it's impossible to get wrong so I think something that where it just comes out you're like oh I didn't practice it like that that sounded legit so that we don't have to think about it yes internalizing is where you actually believe it now here's the thing guys little another secret you can practice 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 but you really sharpen and develop your skills of overcoming objections at a high level when you do it and you fail at it when you do it and do it and do it and do it again, in person, in live, where your armpits start to sweat, where you get nervous and you fall flat on your face. You walk out of that appointment, it's so devastating in your mind, you never do it again, right? Not never, but it really, when I was talking to the top producers and um, it, you know, it was, you can't hire somebody to do your jogging for you. And you can't just sit in a room and just read these things. You have to get out there, use them. You have to feel silly. You have to be, you know, and that's why if you're, if you're starting in this industry and you're um, building your career, I mean, utilize the heck out of cold calling. They don't know you. Don't practice on your people. You know what I mean? So anyway, with that. I just go over this really quickly. Um, this class it might be a little different just depending on the participation. I truly believe that real learning begins when you participate, pay attention, mindset, and have conversation going back. That can be hard in a Zoom, right? How many people are in a Zoom and they're over here cooking or doing this or doing that? Um, so I go over a little mindset. If you're gonna show up for the game, then play the game. You know, be attack, be open to what you hear, even if you don't like it might get controversial here. The open, respect vulnerability and yours and other people. So when people want to, you know, speak up and say something, um, a lot of times in an actual class, you can see people kind of, well, I would never say that, or you would, you know, you get into this. So um, feeling uncomfortable is an absolute must. So I might call on people just randomly to try this out or to have a discussion or a conversation. And I want you to feel uncomfortable because that's how you learn this stuff. Um, and then cheer others on, that's whatever. Okay, first thing we're gonna start with, and this actually came from the very beginning when I did this a million years ago. I revamped this whole thing because I really went from these top producers. But one thing that was 100% was constant or, or consistent, apologize, is a strong mutual expectation conversation up front with a buyer or a seller or a potential lead. What do I mean by a strong upfront mutual expectation script? That means not just showing up and having a conversation about what you do, what you provide. Um, just talk to me, somebody, Amanda, what does mutual expectations mean to you? For me, like what your roles are, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. And perhaps your expectation is this and I'm failing you if I do that. So like most people go, I'm not going to show you houses unless you get pre-approved or something like that. Exactly. So what a mutual expectation and a strong one. One, it, it's um, a presentation of your expertise and your strength and your confidence. I can tell you consumers they want a confident realtor. They want a realtor in this market that is strong and knows what they're doing and understands them. They don't want to argue. They don't want you to tell them they're wrong. All of those things. A mutual expectation script, a strong, strong one. Now, I put it together here, but again, you have to make it your own. Um, this one is basically with the buyer. I'm going to read it. Okay. Actually, Jeffrey, you read it. 
I'm gonna All make right. Data. Mr. Byer, in my experience, conflict arises when mutual expectations are not met. I would like to complete the mutual expectations exercise with you. Is that okay? Yes. Is it? Okay. First, I'd like you to share with me your expectations from a professional and your expectations on the home buying experience overall. For example, communication. Do you prefer emailing, texting, or calling? Oh, sorry. Um, I am a texter. I don't return oh, calls. Perfect. Second, in return, will I will share with you what I expect from the process. However, for example, loyalty. I expect loyalty in this process. And then explain how you get it. Okay. So again, this is an example of a conversation. However, it's the point is exactly what I said. Mutual expectations, when they're not met, that's when conflict arises. And when you've been doing this a long time, the same things are going to come up, right? So this is the part where you get to say, but like very systematically, we're going to talk about expectations. I want to know exactly what you expect from me. And then in return, I get to tell you what I expect from you. I threw loyalty in there. Um, it's kind of funny because I kept it in there because I wanted to get some opinion, some um, some uh, conversation going. So when you're setting your own expectations, you want to absolutely list what you expect. So give me what do you expect from a buyer, Amanda? Just throw something out. What do you really want to buy? And you can't use loyalty. open conversation. I want them to trust me and let me guide them. Um, I want them to keep my name in the back of their head if they're at an open house or at a new construction, you know, business. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it to a script. What are your expectations? Listen, through this process, I expect open door communication. And what that means by open door communication is one, when you're in the process of buying a house, everybody's an expert. Your mom's brother, sister, your uncle in Ohio, everybody's an expert. The people at your office, and it's the top of mind awareness. They're talking about it. Um, open door communication means if ever you have a concern or a question or even want to bounce off what someone said, I need you to, to call me and talk to me about it. And open door communication also means that at any time I'm failing you in any way or you don't like something, my ego is at the door. That's the big script, guys. Through this process and in this in this particular climate, it gets emotional, right? I'm just asking you a good question, right? It gets emotional. And then they're gonna talk to all their friends. So what your expectation here is, I, I want open door communication. I want you to be able to give me a call and talk to me at any time. Ego's at the door. If it's me, let me know. That is very powerful. Um, another expectation you can have from a buyer is to work with you exclusively. Go into how you get paid. Um, do it with the confidence. Again, when I was having these conversations, it's so different than the original script, you know, that I, you know, had created before. And the fact that it was more conversational based and it was about conversation. So understanding what you expect from that person. By the way, as a buyer, seller pays the full commission. That's how I get paid. I don't get paid unless I get, you know, that commission. Um, my time is money. I do this for a living. So I'm going to go through this as an expert, you know, then you can go through your process and what you do, taking them out, showing them whatever expectations you have, list them. Now, you might be asking, why didn't I list all those? Because here's the reality. Again, it's your expectation. It's your experience. I can give you four or five, but if you've ever been burned by a buyer, what did you need differently to happen? Grab that, throw it in your presentation, and have it there. Does that make sense? So a strong mutual expectation, whether you're talking about a buyer or a seller, and that is asking what they expect and then telling what you expect. It's about more educating to the process and always end with asking a question. That was a big, consistent one I heard as well. Okay. Into the script part. I heard this maybe out of the 10, eight times, maybe eight, maybe seven, but heard it from everybody. How many of you have had sit down at the listing? We don't have to sell. Who's had that? Come on. I can't see everybody. I'd pick on you. I can't just pick on Jeff and Amanda. 
Uh, come on. Danielle's camera's on. We want to see your face. I want to see your face. That's what my niece always says. Gabe, come on. You're a master. You do a bunch of stuff. Jump in here. Have you heard? I don't have to sell. Oh, oh I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. Yes. I've heard. I don't have to sell. Um, I've, I've heard. Uh, yeah, we're just kind of kicking tires right now. Um, so yeah, I've, I've definitely ran into situations with that, um, early on when, uh, doing listing points. What do you say? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to call me out. <laughs> Good job! Uh, so this yeah, exactly. like, Hey, that's a great time. You know, uh, you know, uh, do you have a timeline? Are you looking at three to six months? Most of my clients are six to 12 months out anyway. So I can definitely check in with you in about two months. How does that sound? Okay. All right. Anybody else want to jump in or you make me pick on you? What do you say? Mikey, come on, you teach scripts. What do you say when someone says, I, I don't have to sell? What are we talking <laughs> for then? You know, what are we having a conversation if you don't have? No, I'm just playing. Sorry, hey, you know what? Call. That was, I mean, like, why am but I here? I would say if, if I got their information, and I guess that would be the backstory. Like, what? How did I get their information? Were they looking for a CMA or um, uh, updated market analysis? What? What is that? You know, um, if I didn't know any of that though, and I just like, let's say they just, I don't know, we just started talking. They don't need to sell. Well, what would what would what would take your motivation to needing to sell or wanting to sell? Like, what what would that look like? Um, is it the right price? Is it the time frame? Would you be able to move right now if I got you the perfect price? That's the conversation, I guess, of how I would go about it. But I would need, I would definitely want more backstory of how I got the uh, the lead because that's how I would put it back on them. Like they reached out on a market analysis. It's like, well, why'd you reach out then if you weren't, you know, if you don't need to sell? What what was the what was the main motivation about reaching out to a top agent for okay. us to talk about it? All of those things. Accurate, good to use, scripts, a lot of agents said this. Now I'm just going to be real direct with everybody. So I chose the response of what I thought was the most powerful, not I thought, but I know of. So I'm going to give you a little back history on this particular script. The person that gave me this, the person that went through the conversation um, is a wholesaler and is a, I mean, gosh, he does probably... 80 to 90 contracts a month. He is not an agent. He doesn't have his salespeople are not agents. They are straight up wholesaler investors. Very big marketing platform, been doing it for years. Here's what's interesting and what I want to share with you. So he immediately said, we don't have to sell. Mind you, 95% of the people that reach out to him are responding to a sell it quick, cash, need it now. 90% of the people he is sitting in front of are in some kind of financial despair or dispute. Like it was just comical. And I hope I'm communicating this accurately, but it was comical because like what you said, Mikey, I'd get back on why are we here? Well, anybody that's in front of him, they have to sell, but they'll sit back and go, we don't have to sell. His response in that, and the reason I shared that is, again, he does this over and over and over and over. He knows from a psychological perspective, by the time it gets in front of them, they probably have to sell. Now, in your situation, you may not know if they have to sell. In his, and that's where you become in the discovery process. In his situation, they typically always have to sell. Now, what he does is he uses psychology. And when he was going through this, I was like, this is exactly like it pertains to Mikey. It pertains to a res residential. And all these years, we teach people all of those scripts, but his was really actually very different. And he said, 100%. So I'm going to go through a conversation. And this is what we came up with together. It's not what you say. It's what you hear. It's what you're listening to, where your expertise come up, and the questions you ask. Biggest mistake agents make is not practice, they, they don't practice active listening, right? They, I've seen this, I've seen, I've been in a listing appointment and this person's just going into the script and I know the seller and the seller is a high D and I can tell this high D seller is looking at him going, you are handing me a script. Active listening, you have to really 
listen and find your cues and what you can pounce on. Again, he's in a situation where they usually have to sell, but this would work in any situation. Um, and I'm going to go into more depth. Repeat what you hear. So when they're telling you, it's a really strong practice to repeat what you hear. For example, um, I should have got an example in my head. But if someone says, uh, I don't have to sell, but I just got married and I want to move in with him. Okay, so what you're telling me is you don't have to sell, but you want to move in with your new husband. Congratulations, the love of your life. I mean, I'm, I'm making this up as I go, but repeat what they say to you because of a couple of reasons. One, you might hear something completely different. Two, psychology tells you that if you repeat what they say, your brain, it gets into a conversation and you can actually pick out the real reasons they have to sell or want to sell. Um, here's the clinger. This is the big, the meat. There's so much around this, this um, script, if you will. Um, but here's the actual meat. It's want versus need versus have, have to, or must. This person, when I was talking, his name is Brian Spitz. He's brilliant. Um, when I was talking to him, he was, he said, you know, they say I don't have to sell. And he immediately goes, you don't have to do anything. I mean, you don't have to. Um, you have a conversation, ask questions. You don't just go into a script. Like for script purposes, I can go into it with you. But the key and the magic was what happened in between that statement. You know, nobody has to sell. And then into the script. Are you following me on that? Like there's, a, there's, a, there's that gap where you're actually listening. So he goes through, you don't have to sell, ask some questions, get the situation, things of that sort. They have some background, but he actually identifies it. And he says, timing is everything on this. The bit, another big mistake top producers make is using scripts in a condescending way. And people can feel that, right? Um, you know, if I got you this price today, would you move tomorrow? If you're, if it's a script, if you don't feel it, you're not saying it correctly, that's, they're going to hear it. Does that make sense? Um, so he goes through the definition of want, want, the definition of want is a desire or a wish for something to happen. Um, the definition of need is require something because it's essential or very important. And then have to is the need to be forced or must. Again, this particular script, the information that he pulls from these individuals is how he ties it into overall work, right? You're going to define um, where are you in those three categories? I mean, is this just a desire? Is it fun? Is it required or very important? What's going to happen if you don't? Listen, let them talk. Um, have to means the need or forced to or must. Are you being forced to, to sell? Um, Think you you must sell? Is that am I? Are you guys following me on this? To, I need a hands up. Yeah, I I love this because e even if you're not in like a distressed seller situation, even if you're in a like Mike was saying, finding their motivation, then you can like if they go, oh, I just want to, and they say, hey, I want to move in with my husband. You could take that and say, okay, since it's not a distressed one, future pace it. What would that look like for you to spend more time with your husband? You know, what would that do for your life? And then there, there's an emotional attachment rather than it's just a sales call. Thank you. Yes. And you can identify, I mean, you really can identify want to. Is it a desire? Is it just a wish? Um, is it required or essential or very important? When you say, I want to move in with my, I, I mean, do you think living together is essentially very important for a marriage to work out? You know what? That was a bad example. I know a very happy couple that do not live together. I'm not kidding. They, and they they work out right. I, I, I think she's kind of caught it. Maybe figure it out. Um, okay. So anybody want to spin off that? Can I get some feedback? Okay. Did that yeah, help you at all? Does that give I was you gonna, I was going to say the same thing. Sean says uh, to kind of let them paint their motivation for you. Get them to self-realize why they are having the conversation in the first place. So it's something like, can you name, you know, just one benefit that would happen to you or your family if you sold your house? And then usually the first thing that comes to their mind, or the first few things that come to mind is the reason they want to sell their house. And then you dig into that. 
So mm -hmm. same thing, a lot much shorter version. Well, and even creating this, I want to go back to the actual psychology and conversation behind it. It's not just a, um, you know, I could throw in some scripts. You guys do that all the time. I, I, anyway, so. Okay. All right. How many of you heard waiting for the market to get better or waiting for the market to crash? Or I'm just going to sit back and wait. Somebody talk to me. All right. Cody, what do you hear? Sorry, getting unmuted. Um, yeah, just a lot of people uh, not wanting to wait. Um, you know, I've been talking to some expires or just some people that, you know, want to wait and list a property in either the spring or the summer. Um, and so, uh, you know, the only thing that I've really been doing is, you know, just trying to explain to them and show them with the numbers, you know, where appreciation has gone and, and where it's going. And uh, what's happening with rates? So just try and back it up with market knowledge, um, you know, and go down there. So exactly. So again, that's not just a script, right? Um, right? That is knowledge. You're going to have to educate them on the knowledge. So what was kind of fun about this? How I decided to do this one um, with a particular agent, and it was I'm going to go over what not to do and then what to do. Exactly what you just said, Cody. Educate yourself. You have to know what the market is. You have to believe that the market is still healthy. You have to believe that these people should buy. I'm going to share with you just a little quick. Um, for instance, for me, again, 23, 22 years in this business, I want to just strangle people when they're like, oh my God, interest rates are so high. I think they're like at 6%. I'm like, bitch, I bought my first house at 13%. Like, I mean, and I was like, Whoa, that was what, 20 years ago? I mean, seriously, I've seen so many different markets and I'm just shocked. And it becomes down to, I passionately believe it's this comparison and it's really not an, I don't want to be rude, but an educated statement. These people don't know what they don't know, but I believe it. I've been there. I would jump on a 6% money. That's still cheap money, comparatively speaking. And it's not a reason to not buy a home. So I want to shift this a little bit. Again, you know the script, you know, going into the market and there's some other tips will go, but what not to do and what a lot of agents don't disagree with the lead. Okay. A lot of people immediately, nope, that's not true. Let me tell you why it's great. Or maybe they're not that harsh. They go, oh, okay. Um, this was the common one. And again, these are conversational based scripts. A uh, common one was, um, what, uh, so get better. What does that, you know, what does that mean to you? What does get better mean to you? Again, you're diving in. What does better mean to them? Does that mean better interest rates? Well, then you're going to go down that road because come on. Uh, or does it mean um, more inventory? Well, then you got to go down that road. You got to talk about inventory. So it goes back to the question and defining and the active listing. Don't disagree. Don't jump in because you already know. And by the way, I'm super guilty of doing that. All right. When I coach and consult agents, I already know what they're going to say. And I want to jump on it in my own script. <laughs> but it's stopping and actually listening, which my coach helps me with. And I say back in my head, don't give the, don't give the prescription before really getting the diagnosis right? Um, so don't disagree. Don't make the lead wrong. Don't get into that. Ego's big. Um, know your behavioral styles. You're working with a high D. Don't make him wrong. You are not there to be right. You're there to make it right. Um, that's a big thing. People, you know, they, well, I do this every day and da, 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 da. Educate the lead. It's not to. Do not Educate the lead before you understand them. Do you see this common thread here? It's going to go back to asking questions, really listening. And you're not going to get to be a master at these conversations unless you do them all the time. And you're not sitting here thinking about what you're supposed to say next because you learned it in a script class. So it makes sense. You, you have to learn to listen. You got to know those scripts, but where to go with those scripts is going to be the difference maker. Um, don't try to close immediately. That was huge to me. Is that, I mean, some of this stuff, guys, this was such a great uh, experience for me personally. Again, you get comfy and teaching scripts and things of that sort. And 
it, I was talking again, these producers, 20, 30, 40 million dollar producers, it wasn't just a la 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 la. It was an actual psychology conversational piece. Um, closing immediately, this came from the horse's mouth. Um, this came from Mike Malstead, who is a huge producer, um, and he's in the top end market. He deals with a lot of high Ds, and one thing he was talking about, so he's in the high end. You know, a lot of people that he's dealing with, they have sold companies, they're heart surgeons, they are CEOs, and it's just a God complex. Oh, God, we're recording this, aren't we? Oh, forgot, shouldn't name drop that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I asked him, he said I could. Anyway. Point is, he's sitting across the table from somebody that's done what 90% of the population hasn't. So when you're going to make a close or you're going to go in hard, they're going to feel it. These people do this for a living. Now, they don't know real estate like you know. Again, that goes back to, uh, to confidence. But a lot of agents go wrong in trying to close immediately with some script doesn't mean you're not trying to get them to the finish line and to walk away. It's trying to close it with a script. And I think an example of that is kind of what we were talking about, Mackie, Mikey, Mackie, Mikey, about if you say, if I get you this right price, will you buy tomorrow? You can still say that. And again, it has to get back into the list, you know, listening where you're going to go with that. Um, waiting for the market to get better. What you should do, get the leads perspective. Really understand why do they feel that way? Even if you know you're right, why, what is it that makes them think it's better? Um, get the leads experience. I loved this one. So when you say waiting for the market to get better, in your mind, what, what does that mean? Like what does better mean? That's an authentic question. You're trying to find out what does better mean? It better be different for me, different from you. And then go with experience. They're going to have an experience. If you have a similar experience to share, overcoming objections with your own experience is absolutely genius. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the experience that you have, listening to theirs, there's a reason they feel this way. They have a friend that did this, that did that, that did this. There's just so many nuggets you can pull out of that and have a conversation about. Again, we'll go into a little bit more of that. Tell the lead the benefit of moving forward now. Again, you have to really believe that they should move forward now. And let me ask you something. Honest to God, I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick on somebody I haven't picked on. Let me go down this little list. Justin, Justin, going for you. Okay. Um, do, when, do you absolutely believe if somebody has money in the bank and somebody is renting, and somebody has the ability to buy, do you believe they should buy now? Absolutely. Okay. You believe that. You don't think uh, they should wait. Yeah. They should never throw their money away to 100% interest, which is a renting. Okay. And so is, is that what you say? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Going back to now, I'm using the same thing with Justin. I know that Justin... He, when he says, why do you have to leave now? He truly attaches that to a financial benefit. That's just not smart leaving your money over there, right? Um, educate the lead after understanding their perspective. So you don't know which route to take when you're educating unless you really understand where they're coming from. Identify the motivation, motivation and ability. We know that. And here was an interesting one. Set a logical next step. And... I tied that back into, when I was having this conversation, I tied that back into um, that not heavy close. You want to get to the finish line. You absolutely want to get to the finish line. That heavy close, though, is where you can get into, you know, deep waters. But setting a logical step, understanding a behavioral style, not just walking away, but not being so attached to not walking away. Is that crazy? Have you ever thought about that? Anybody? Or have you been taught your whole life, you don't walk away from the table, you don't walk away from the table. I literally heard from an $80 million producer, his average price point's about $2 million, say you can't be attached to not walking away from the table. You have to give a logical next step that is good for them. And if you don't believe it's good for them, you have to, don't do it. I mean, anybody have anything to spin off of that? I'd never heard that. 
I thought it was interesting. Okay, going on to next. This goes for buyers and sellers. So this is kind of like a double script. And that was, um, this was super consistent too. This kept coming up. And it's showing that the buy buyers and sellers, showing whoever your client, whatever your prospect, showing them that the market is moving. Who believes the market's moving? Still moving. Okay. I hear from agents all the time. And if you're one of them on this Zoom, I'm sorry. I won't say your name. But when they go, just nothing's moving. It's just sitting there. The market's just sitting there. Well, really, I'm entitled. Shit's moving. Okay. You, you, you gotta, you probably have a price adjustment. You probably have an expectation adjustment. Sounds like you have an ob objection to overcome because it's moving. When it's right, it's moving. Um, so really showing people now, if you watch the news, it's not moving, right? If you talk to an agent that does great. I mean, they talk to me very vulnerably. They're, they're not trying to get me to sell. Nothing's moving. Yes, it is. This guy over here, his business is moving right through my title company. <laughs> it's moving. So um, gave a little example of a conversation. Again, I was really excited to show you. This is the buyers. I was really, and this, and this, okay, never mind. I'll just let you guys, I'll get your feeling off this. I was really excited to show you seven homes today, but two of them have gone under contract, so they're no longer available. Let's go see these other five. And when you find the one you fall in love with, we'll make an offer on it. Make sure somebody doesn't get it. Okay, what does that do to you? What, how do you feel about that script? There's some FOMO in there. Like, oh, someone might take my house. Things are moving. It's like going to an open house and seeing four other people looking at your kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I usually get it's kind of passive aggressive. When I get, you know, I get, I want you, if you want to push back, push back. That's where the conversation comes in. I've heard others say it's a little passive aggressive. I love it. It works for me. I mean, like, I, I just love it. Other people don't. Other people think it's a little pushy. Other people think, and here's the reality, whether you're in this market or somebody else's market, I mean, somebody else is in a different market. Like, for instance, over what, 21 and 22, could you say this script with absolute certainty and not need a script, right? You could. I mean, buyer's agents were ready to jump. They were like, oh my God, right? I, like they just keep, they're losing out. They're doing seven multiple offers. Their little spirit's broken. Now in this market, can you authentically say that? What do you think? Do you think if you had to, you could show people that things were moving? Amanda, yes, yes, okay. So let them both know that things are moving. Um, how many of you have gotten this? I, I only got this from one, um, but said they heard it a lot more before in the last, well, that's what this is for, 22. But, but I didn't hear it as much as I heard the others. However, it was, it did come up more than, you know. So tell me, how many of you have heard this? Let me raise hand, somebody. All right. Do you, are you still hearing it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to pick on somebody because y'all ain't talking to me and I fight rejection issues. All I right. can say something on it. Go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people, uh, that I've talked to over the last couple of months have said that. And, you know, part of the issue uh, that they've explained for them was that uh, the properties that were available uh, weren't of their standards or needs. Uh, we do have a limited uh, inventory of, uh, you know, new construction homes down here in the Pearland area. Um, and because there's not really any um, in Pearland itself. And so there's that issue. Um, that people, you know, that's a, re that's a real concern. I mean, not being able to find something, you know, that meets their needs and their location, uh, you know, and then right now, the fact that people aren't listing because they want to find a property is actually hurting the buyers that the, that it, they're in the same exact situation. They need to get their home on the market so it can be available for somebody to come in and purchase, um, you know, so uh, yeah. 100%. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the bullet points. And then I'm going to share an experience and I'm going to tie it into what we talked about before. When you're overcoming an objection, come with an experience. 
um, whether it's your experience or someone else's, but explain the contingency process. If you truly understand the contingency process, it's, I, I personally would never want to get into it, right? I'm just going to go through it. We'll go back. Uh, but, and you guys know the contingency process. Um, negotiation power. When you're in a contingent upon, so like they find a house, but it's contingent upon the sale of this house, um, you have no negotiation power. Why as a listing agent, or sorry, as a seller, why would I ever go under a contract with you? So then you're going to put your house on the market, go put your house on the market, sell it and come back to me when you can buy this in 30 days. But people do it from time to time, but it's a negotiation power on an offer. Why would I even accept that offer? All right, here we get into the psychology. And this is true. Um, you're more likely to take less money for your sell once you have your heart set on the house you want. How many of you have seen that, right? Have you ever been there? You ever found a house you want? You live in a house and all of a sudden your house looks like shit. That house looks really pretty. <laughs> you really <laughs> want that house and everything's like falling off and you're starting to notice. It's like, it's like when you want to break up with somebody, right? You start noticing everything they do wrong. <laughs> they swallow. <laughs> Where they eat. Um, you're more likely to take less. Risk factor. Uh, go into the risk factor. And again, I'm going to share this experience to tie this all together. And truly the risk factor is once you've explained it, and, and you've got a conversation going, you end this with, do you see how buying and selling, buying before selling could lead you to lose both ends of the transaction? So I'm going to explain that, give you an experience. Uh, it was COVID, during COVID shutdown, right? I was at a friend's house. Next door neighbor had their house listed. I love this neighborhood with all my heart. Um, you know, when you're being quarantined all of a sudden everything's falling apart too you're all like you know squished in together neighbor says hey house is on the market but I know that it's contingent upon the sell of this other house so this neighborhood's real tight-knit everybody knows each other and that house is on the market but it's not moving well what I know Tamara knows in a contingency process I can put an offer on that and then they have what is it Amanda two weeks there's a, there's a day. It's, there's it's negotiable. Usually it's five to seven days, five to seven days. Thank you. It's the, whatever they put that seller has five to seven days to accept it. I mean, sorry, contingency person to remove that contingency. Right. So if they're like, Hey, we got an offer. You got five to seven days. We're going to remove that contingency and we're closing. Right. That's, that's the situation. So I know I'm putting them into that situation. So that was exciting for me. Okay. Also, what do I know? I know this seller is somewhat really motivated because they went under a contingency contract, right? I also happen to know that they sat on the market for eight months before that and only because the pricing was stupid and unrealistic. Since I understand the market, that doesn't turn me off. Somebody like my husband, who's a consumer, still gets all nervous about it. Do you see where from a negotiation standpoint, I was like, this is like taking candy from a baby. I'm super excited. Um, offer a low ball, 30 days, 50% down, low ball it, jumped on it. So what it does is for that seller, right? And that other seller lost out on the contract of the house they wanted. And then they ended up taking their house off the market. So do you, do you see where I'm going with that? It's sharing an experience. Um, absolutely got the house. And what I found out later, that's why I kind of loved this one, is that the people that were selling had their heart set on a house already. So they were willing to take less. They were willing to do whatever they needed to do because they really wanted this other house. This is just kind of fun, this part. That house is owned by a very big top producer in our neighborhood, who I know. Top producer calls me and says, hey, they want to buy my house, but they're going to do a contingency on whether you close it. Mind you, this is in the middle of a shutdown, right? Nobody knows what's going on. And Tamara, I'm asking you, are you buying this house? I would not do a contingent. That's stupid. But if you're going to buy this house, you tell me you're buying this house, I'll do it. And I was like, oh, I'm buying this house. I'm buying this house. So they did a contingency on that house. 
this is just food, kind of fun. So right before our financing option is over, we're done, we're married, right? We've put in the contract, all that. My husband called me, he's like, do we really want to do this? I mean, do we really want to do this? We could wait. We could see what's going to happen with the market. And no lie, I wanted to do it. Really, I did. But no lie, guys. I was like, I got two top producers, a top loan officer that does a lot of business with me. And I can't afford to back out. They will never use me again. Like, I'm going to burn bridges with five people that all do a bunch of business with me. No, we're moving forward. I told that other agent that my you know word was solid. We had to take it, but it was just kind of funny. Going back to the script on not ready to find a vote, go through, explain the contingency process and how it works. Give an experience like that. I'm sure you have one. Use mine. The negotiation power, the psychology is that's the reality. You are going to probably take less because you're just so attached to moving. These are the things that will come up and the risk factor. You could lose it all. So anyway, any spin off that? Anyone want to say anything about that one? No. I would have resources too, like Jeff's talking in this little chat thing. There's like cash for keys or Divi or programs where you can pay cash for your next house and you have three or six months to sell your other house. So I think just being a resource and giving those options, it'll be less pressure, but totally the psychology of it is, is huge. I love that you said that because at the end, we're going to do a little discussion part. And that was one of the little discussion points is truly having the um, resources. Sí, mira, es que se está apagando. O sea, el See, <laughs> I don't speak Spanish. Anyway, okay, we run along. How many of you guys have had the, um, this one came up a lot too, which I found was interesting. We want a certain feature. What does that mean? Anybody, have you, have you had that with a buyer and you go through everything and like it's the perfect house, but they're like, oh, but it doesn't have the pool that I wanted. Or it doesn't have, you know, a feature. Anybody? I this comes in with uh, the setting expectations with your client in the first initial conversation. 100%. Well, Mikey gets a gold star. Yes, this is tying it back to your expectations. It's also, guys, when you got into this industry, you thought you were selling houses. But you're, you're you know, half therapist. Um, sometimes you're a handyman. I mean, I know... Agents that keep ladders and, you know, hammers because you never know when you're going to need it. And, you know, you, you signed up for all these things. But a lot of this is about the human experience and human behavior and being able to tap in to the psychology and helping them come to what they want, right? If I have an agent and I want to do this, and I've had certain situations where I kind of need you to talk me into it. I want you to talk me into it. But you really can't talk me into it. I want it. I just want you to talk me into it. If I don't want it, you're not talking me into it. You're not that powerful, right? There's the whole psychology behind it. So when you're holding the hands of people and the first sign of buying signs is when they start tearing it apart. When they walk in and they're like, oh, I got this. Oh, I got this. Again, human psyche starts to pull it apart when they get a little nervous, a little scared, and they're going to jump in. So here's the script, and then I want to kind of talk about it. It's Mr. Buyer. Uh, remember our first meeting when we talked about there being su no such thing as 100% perfect house. Refer to the five must-haves. You should do that in your mutual expectations with buyer, the five must-haves. We identified a pool as being the five must-haves in your new home. It has a, oh, sorry, I should just read it. We identified blank as being the five must-haves in your new home. Has a formal dining room taken precedence over one of these items? If so, which one? Um, and if the answer is yes, we'll, we'll need to do a new search. So that, again, it's a script, but you throw in the, you're, you're helping them to chunk it down, the decision to be chunked down. So like you said that you wanted a pool and you said that you wanted a yard and you said you wanted to go to VOE, um, you know, it has all those things. One of the ones that were like number, but you don't, you want it because of this formal dining room. Does that take precedence over one of those? Are you following me on that? Does that make sense? Um, it's going back to your expectations. And it's also, again, the psychology of talking them into it. They want to get talked into it. They need to be talked into it. I want you to talk me into it. <laughs> but really, you can't talk me into it. All right. How are we doing on time? Oh, good. Getting on time. All right. Here was for um, buyers. 
and sellers, but the, the one consistent that I heard um, and, and kind of like what I heard earlier, which was not consistent. I've always been taught you never walk away. You never walk away. Well, you aren't attached to never walking away, but you have a logical next step. And that's the difference in walking away and keep going and with, you know, an end in mind. Um, and it's setting the next appointment. I heard this a lot with, so some of the people I talked to um, have big teams and have buyer's agents and things of that sort. And they said, you know, for their buyer's agents, they see this a lot. Well, they're going to get back with me or I'll just call you later or I'll just reach out to you. It's truly setting the appointment right there, putting it on your calendar. Um, so it's just, um, I'm going to make somebody read it. If somebody want to volunteer, I'm going to just pick a name. Janet, your realtor. Can you please read the script for me? Oh, you have to come off mute. You're on mute. Okay, it says, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, before we part company, get out your calendar. We're going to set up our next meeting to look for that home you want to buy. If nothing has hit the market by Friday, I'm going to give you a call and we'll reschedule for next Saturday. Okay, guys, did I just score on picking Janet, your realtor? That voice, I mean, it sounds like, did you ever do radio or anything before? Anybody? No, but no? I, no, but I have a huge communication background. <laughs> I mean, it was beautiful. Um, I can tell. I mean, she just read a script that she's never read before. And it kind of sounded like you. Like, I, I don't know that I would know it's a script. When anybody reads these that comes off, you know, chunky and because it's, you're reading it and Janet, your realtor, you just, yeah, I mean, she, you just took Mikey's gold star. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> okay. So this goes back to setting the appointment, getting it out there, putting it on the calendar right away. Um, not letting it fall out to too much time, by the way, true confession. Again, something I'm super guilty with. You know, um, at least when you guys are lead generating, you're calling strangers or new people. In my world, about 20% of the population is doing 80%. I got to call the people that have told me no seven times before. <laughs> it's the same people. <laughs> so I can get to where I'm like, okay, I'll call you later. Like, what are we going to meet for again? What are we going to meet? I saw no, it's, anyway, sharing some vulnerability. Now, my coach works on me that. It's still an appointment because at one point, Human nature, people get disengaged with each other and it's about timing. So when that escrow assistant or somebody does something a little wrong, they're going to think of Tamara, right? That's the basic anyway. All right. I've always liked this one. How many of you use this? When people are kind of on the fence. Anybody? It's make an offer so you can always back out later. Do you guys use that? I mean, I know you use that. Oh, I use the option period all the time. I'll go, I'll even pay your hundred dollars if you back out. <laughs> Absolutely. No risk, baby. Right. And you know what I found? Um, just a little add-on. Again, we're being recorded. I forget. I'm so just transparent. And then I just know I'm gonna, you know, throw somebody under. But even in the big investor boom, they used this tactic a lot, right? Just get it under contract. And then we're gonna figure out what we want. It was the first time in my world I would see a contract. It wasn't a one to four family. It was a contract that signed and they would add in their earnest money option. Um, but we won't deposit earnest money until inspections or this part is like, like, it's just all this stuff because they had their own contract just to kind of give you it. But this, this has been a tactic and a um, resource that people have used for years and it's true. It's like, what do you have to lose, right? And all these years later in different markets, it's it still seems to be true. Um, all right, Janet, your realtor, can I pick on you? You just sounded so pretty. I want to hear your voice again. And you don't have to do it perfect. I just want to hear your voice. Would you read this? Yes. Um, I understand how you feel. And many buyers I've worked with have felt the same. What I found out is that it's better to make an offer than back out later if necessary. There's several ways to back out of an offer. 
But if you don't make the offer before someone else does, you'll never even have the opportunity to think it over. It will be gone. So let's make an offer to lock your home. And just to kind of add, Tamara, this is great for new construction because builders are not in the business of keeping earnest money. So this is a really good script. Thank you. Great. I didn't even think about the new construction part, but um, yeah, yeah. So it, and it goes back to, and, and again, using experiences to help people out. Have you guys, has anybody ever had a buyer and they found the house they absolutely loved? and then didn't make an offer and lost it? Does that ever happen? Show of hands. Does that ever happen to you personally? I mean, yeah. you want to talk about wah, wah, wah. And then what happens is they're like, I mean, it's it's true. It, it kind of everything's your fault if it doesn't work out. So like if wife is like, I love this, I want this now. And husband, that was stuck this. Let me turn that around. What if husband's like, I want this right now. And wife's like, nope, I'm going to think about it. I need to do some numbers. I don't want to do this. And then they go home and husband's in love with it. And the next day it's gone. Now husband's pissed at wife. And this is why I don't let you negotiate. Ooh, that just turned it around, huh? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, and I would always use that. If, if you, if you look, there's a, what do they call it? That was another thing. Um, a motivation scale. Is it motivation scale? No, pain factor. Once you use this script, you can go into the pain factor. Is anybody familiar with pain factor? Amanda, you're doing your head. So you go tell it what's pain factor. What, what, I'll, what I'll do for them, I'll say, as long as you're not going to be devastated if we don't make this offer and on Saturday you find out someone else has it, then I'm totally cool with it. That way it's kind of on their, on their thing. So maybe for your pain factor on a scale of zero to 10, like how upset would you be? Right. This, you, um, yeah, on scale, how upset would you be? You can use this also. This is really great when you're like stuck at a standoff in price, right? Like say they're like, we're only paying 450 and you're at 475 and they're just like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Um, and you can go back and go, okay, get it. That's your bottom line. I'm going to ask you this. I want you to think about this and you're, you can answer in your head. You don't even have to answer me. Only you know this. Um, let's say we walk away. We're done. And it sells tomorrow for $4.75. Are you going to be like, damn, good, because I wasn't going to go there anyway. They can have it. Or are you going to be like, shit, I would have totally paid four seventy five. dollars That's a real good fear factor, right? If it goes, if you're at your point money-wise and you truly will not go to that, if it sells for that, you're not hurt. You weren't going to go for that. Again, talking people into what they want. You're not powerful not enough to talk them into what they don't want, okay? Um, so using that pain factor. All right, we're coming up to the end. I'll, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Um, get to the bottom. This is another thing that was consistent. Get to the bottom line with buyers and sellers. We know by statistics, like I think it's 87% of real estate agents carry a high eye. Uh, if you're familiar with behavioral styles, the high eye is the fluffy, the friend, the social. They don't like rejection. They want to make everybody happy. Um, and a high eye, a really high eye can get just sucked into this because they don't get to the bottom line. Now, you know, you know, DCs, all that kind of stuff. But my point is, what was consistent is really getting good at, if you're not good at getting to the bottom line, get good at getting to the bottom line. And that may be what you're looking for doesn't exist, you know, and to be able to say that without a condescending, you know, or ask, because that sounded a little asshole, excuse my language, but to me when I just said it that way, but when you say, here's the reality, what you're looking for doesn't exist. It just doesn't. I mean, um, and so here's a couple things that have to change. I mean, you can wait until you're making more money and step into a higher price point. I mean, hopefully you're not entitled. Um, <laughs> You can adjust your expectations, right? I mean, um, or you can rent for the next year and just see what happens. I mean, what's the best course of action for you? Because here's the thing, guys. If number three is the answer, number three was the answer. It was the answer before. And getting to the bottom line and really 
uh, again, it goes back to when I put the script class, I really did see like my good old fashioned scripts where I, I knew they weren't going to be different because, you know, the big secret is there's no big secret. It's going to be price. It's going to be located, you know, all that stuff. So, but what it turned into is just a higher level of scripting, right? These people about the psychology behind it, the why behind it. And the absolution of all of these people have done it over and over and over and have failed over and over and over. And one of the things that came from one of my conversations, and I loved it, is in this business, you have to be comfortable with failing for a while until you don't. And that's really hard, especially if you're high eyes, right? Like, I got to it's going to be everything you get into in your life, any opportunity, let me tell you, absolute, it's going to cost more than you think. It's going to take more time than you think. And it's going to be harder than you thought. But it's just three things. If you can understand that when you get into your new opportunity, those three things are going to happen. And then you can identify those. It'll help you through your process. But, you know, in this industry and in the success rate, being able to fall on your face and do these scripts and not do it right, or think I should have said that or lose the listing or better yet, overprice the listing, six months, sit on the market, get your butt just completely beaten, you're awful, and they shouldn't have gone with the newer agent, and then they list with Heidi Dugan at the $10,000 below what you even said in the first place, sells it in a week. That kind of pain is where you learn, I'm not doing that again. And that kind of pain is where you'll walk away from a table because it's literally impossible. Just like I said, the, the house that was mine. I mean, they had it this ridiculous rate. It's like, it's like, yeah, anyway, uh, what are you thinking anyway? Um, but getting to the bottom line and being comfortable getting to the bottom line, getting comfortable with being direct. That was kind of what came from um, this. And when you're getting to the bottom line, the way you get comfortable getting to the bottom line is getting messed over by not getting to the bottom line. <laughs> so hopefully this gives you a little step forward as so we can say, okay, you know, that person that's I've been showing for 17 months and she needs to get to the bottom line. <laughs> All right, uh, we're right on time. This kind of, I, I, I did want to do this. And if you guys want to, I mean, you're on Zoom so you can jump off or stay on or whatever, but I'll, I can be here for another five, 10 minutes. Um, those, that's the objection class. By the way, I can stop sharing so I can see more people. There we go. Can I just share with you, y'all, when we went to Zoom, I'm a very expressive individual. It was not good for my self-esteem. I had no idea the facial expressions I would make. I mean, like my lip goes up like Elvis and all this weird stuff. Like I had to stop looking at myself. <laughs> anyway, point being, I wanted to talk about uh, a discussion, if you it will. We went over the scripts. Anybody want to say anything about the scripts? Was that useful? Did you take some, I mean, did you get any ahas? Give me two ahas from a script, from this exercise, if you will. I got one. Um, oh. Yeah, so just the most important thing is just to always, you know, listen, um, which we should probably be told to listen every day so that we remember. Right? I mean, and again, going back to sales personalities and stuff, it's, it's, you know, I struggle myself. All right, listen, anybody else? I did want to say the five things. I've been doing that forever, and it's just amazing to hear that somebody else kind of does it too. And I average two showings per buyer because of that. Yes. So, yeah, that was definitely, a, oh, somebody else does it. So, yes, loved yes. it. Well, and it's funny, Jen, I'll tell you, um, and what I do and agents I work with, different companies, different teams, different cultures within real estate, right? Whether it be boutique or an independent or whatever. Um, it's really interesting to me. Some people are not raised in this world of education and scripts. They just learned it by hard knocks. And when we have a conversation, everything they're saying, I have taught in scripts before. They just don't even know it's a script. I mean, it's like, okay, that was this one, that was this one, but they just learned. So really getting these things, using them, you know, it is a little next level, but again, big secret, this is no big secret. Okay, so um, if you will, if you wanna jump, you can, if you wanna stay around for five minutes, I just wanted to ask people, is there an objection that didn't come up today that you keep running into that you do want? 
some maybe some feedback or from somebody else like do you keep coming up to something that didn't come up there and you'd like to hear that does anybody have that i just thought we should take this opportunity with all these amazing top producers right to have a five minute discussion if you get the opportunity to ask them hey i keep running into this what do you say I slept on my own turf anybody nobody's getting object nobody's getting objections well, then i did a fantastic job right i guess i mean i just rocked out <laughs> okay uh, um go ahead no that's that's it okay. I, I didn't know i was still on my Oh, okay. Well, that's all I got. So thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate this. It's such an honor to have all this talent right here. And if you need anything at all, remember I am with Fidelity National Title. Um, I do this to get contracts. If I don't get contracts, I get fired, which is how you should look at your job, by the way, too. I tell agents that all the time. It was like, you know, not getting it means you're fired. It's like, you know, um, the good news is you don't have a boss. The bad news is you don't have a boss. So anyway, uh, if you have contracts, if you'd like to sit down and talk about how I can help you out in your business, whether it be resources and coaching and things of that sort. I've been around for a long, long time. I raised a lot of top producers. <laughs> Jeffrey's my little brother, if you don't know that. Um, and I raised him. Uh, uh, so if you'd like to sit down and have a conversation about that, I was a team leader for about 14 years of my career for Keller Williams. So, um, you know, all of this comes from validity and training and a maps coach, all that great stuff. Um, so anyway, if you want to do that, I'm here too. How lucky are we to have you in this like little team legacy bubble? I put her email address on here. If you guys want to reach out to her for anything or send her a contract. I work with her team very closely and she has some total alpha badasses that just get some creative, amazing things done. Um, we're, we're so excited to, to get to learn from you. Um, and hopefully we'll get to have you again next month. Yay. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that, Amanda. I can't wait to tell them. Awesome. Anybody have any other oh, questions? 11, 11. We're ending on a lucky number. Yay. Yay. Okay. Can Bye, y'all. Can I? Yes. Sure. Can I say uh, I came in on late, but uh, the, the class was great. Uh, you had some real informative information. I, I like the way uh, you basically explained a lot of the information. I think a lot of times when we're in this, I've only been in realtor less about a year and a half. Um, but I think when you're reading the script, I know I actually was doing the script. Well, I went to script class with Michael Bass, which is a great teacher. Um, you kind of want to actually take the information where that when you explain it doesn't sound like a script, it actually makes it your own. And mm -hmm. the way you explained it, uh, it was very good. I'm glad that uh, I actually got a chance to listen to it and be a part of this. It's great. I Thank think you did a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll tell all wow. the other producers too. So <laughs> thank, thank you, Tamara. Reach out to her if you have any questions or any contracts. We do this every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central. Um, so please pop in. Our goal is to bring value to all of our agents so we can take over to 2023. Let's sell some houses. Okay. Oh, I see it says best phone. Mina, we throw my cell up there. Yes. Do you want me to tell you what it is? 713-927-3433. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Talk soon.